So I'm going to start with my two standard questions. Who's not in a group yet? Who's not in a group yet? Part of that is my mistake. I, the orphan list I sent you was from last year's corporate finance class, and those people were very surprised to hear from you because they've, they've graduated, I think. No, so I fixed that, I think, last night. No. And I know you weren't reading emails in the middle of the Super Bowl, I hope. but. Um, the new list should be the, if you're, so if you're not in a group, get in a group. Okay? I'll try to be matchmaker if you're still stuck by the middle of this week. So if by Wednesday you haven't found a group, let me know and I will be your, no, I'll try to find a group that wants extra people. There's one group of two that I know is looking for additional people. So in fact, those of you not in a group, why don't you email me your, no, your, your, no, the way they can get in touch with you, and so maybe we'll all be in a group. Who's not picked a company yet? Be honest, come on. Okay. Good. I'm, this is my nagging time. Pick a damn company. Don't sit there wrestling with this choice. Just pick something. Let's move on, right? And the only criteria is please don't pick a financial service company. Please don't pick a money-losing company. 
the money losing you have to check. Go to Yahoo Finance, check out the latest financials. You know, because it, it's not that it's difficult to value, it's actually too easy. That's why I'm leading you away from money losing companies, because there's not much you're going to be able to do in terms of corporate finance. So let's pick up where we left off on Wednesday. <clears throat> I set up the process, right? Stockholders have little power over managers because neither mechanism we talked about, the annual meeting nor the board of directors, does much in terms of keeping managers accountable. And if managers don't feel accountable, they're human beings. They're going to put their interests over stockholder interests when the two clash. Well, not always. You might end up with managers and stockholders wanting the same thing, but when they clash, Managers are going to put their interests over stockholder interests. And I said this is going to play out most when you see acquisitions, big acquisitions. So I'm going to take you through a couple of examples so you can see how the acquisition process turns this conflict of interest into a major problem. So here's the first one. It's an acquisition done by Eastman Kodak. Let's go back in time. Eastman Kodak was one of those nifty 50 stocks from the 1970s. It was superstar stock. Eastman Kodak, Polaroid, these were the growth companies of the early 70s. In fact, if you were writing a case study up a, about an incredibly well-managed, well-run company in the mid-1980s, Eastman Kodak was a company that people would use. This is a great company, look how well it's built up itself. Until one day in 1988, one day, the entire reputation of the company changed. It was January 22nd of 1988, but let me take you back in time. Sometime in the middle of 87, Eastman Kodak got interested in buying a pharmaceutical company called Sterling Drugs. <clears throat> they talked about synergy, but it was very difficult to think about what the synergy is between a camera company and a drug company, unless you've discovered an incredibly novel way of delivering drugs to people through camera lens. Okay? <laughs> but there's a lot of talk of synergy. So they made this, I'll give you my guess, I don't know for sure, but I'm sure that this was precipitated by a consultant visiting Eastman Kodak in the mid 80s <laughs> and telling them they look like a cash cow, which they were. Have you ever seen those BCG matrices? <laughs> There's a cash cow, dogs, pigs, and not like a farmyard gone crazy, right? They said, you look like a cash cow, you need a star. In the mid 80s, you know where the stars were, they were all in the pharmaceutical sector. So you can almost see this play out in the background. That's the first thing I want to point out is when you see acquisitions as an entire ecosystem that feeds off acquisitions, consultants, bankers, there'll be plenty of people, these are like drug dealers saying, don't you know, be an addict, it's so good, keep, you know. They're not going to convince somebody, don't use drugs. This is how you make your money. So they get interest in a pharmaceutical company. And the worst of all possible things happens. They get into a bidding war. So let's, let's look at the pharmaceutical company, Sterling Drugs. It's a company that used to trade at $40. Eastman Kodak gets into a bidding war with Hoffman La Roche, a Swiss pharmaceutical company. Hoffman La Roche drops out at $72. Eastman Kodak doesn't even notice. This is like being in an eBay auction. You're bidding against somebody. The person drops out. You forget that that person's dropped out. You bid, you say, I'm beating myself. You'll always win in th this war. Ultimately, somebody must have noticed at 89.50, hey, we're bidding against ourselves. Let's stop. And at 89.50, they win the bidding war. Now, winning is actually a very loaded word in this, in this context because the next day, if you open up the Wall Street Journal, that's how it would have been defined. Eastman Kodak wins bidding war. It pays $89.50 for sterling drugs. On that winning day, that's January 22nd of 1988, Eastman Kodak lost $2.2 billion of market cap in one day. $2.2 billion. Think about how many bad projects you'd have to take to wipe out two point in one day. See, what happened? This might be sheer coincidence, but if you look at the premium that they paid for sterling drugs over what the market cap used to be before they got in the bidding war, they paid, roughly speaking, a $2.1 billion premium. Let me ask you a question. You do an acquisition, you overpay. Where does the money come from? It's not magic. You can't print off money. It has to come from your shareholders. Every time you overpay, that's where it comes from. You're saying, where's the extra $100 million going? A lot of people to be paid. There's an entire ecosystem waiting for you, right? Bankers, consultants. I don't know where the leakage happens, 
but this looks an awful lot like a zero-sum game. But on January 22nd of 1988, if you went to Eastman Kodak's managers and you pointed this out, you know what their response would have been? You don't see what we see. We've seen the cash flows. We see the synergy. Trust us. We know what we're doing. Okay, let's trust them. These are the five years after the acquisition. Remember, synergy is a nice word, but ultimately, where does it have to show up? It has to show up in revenue growth or in margins. So this is what Sterling Drugs looks like with an Eastman Kodak. And the nice thing is because it was kept as a separate division, you could actually see what Sterling Drugs was doing. Its revenue growth was actually lower than the growth rate for the rest of the pharmaceutical sector, and its profits stagnated. So five years after the merger, your question would have been, where's the synergy? And Eastman Kodak would have said, just wait, just wait. In 1992, 19, towards the end of 92, start of 93, rumors started flying that Eastman Kodak was interested in divesting itself of sterling drugs. The initial response from Eastman Kodak no, was that this was massive speculation, you know, don't trust any of this, this is all rumors. You remember the old uh, Russian thing which is never believe anything until it's officially denied? <laughs> okay. So here you go, a few months later, Eastman Kodak said that they were selling off sterling drugs and collectively they were getting about 1.7 billion for one piece and 1.8 billion for the other piece. But basically they were selling it, no, one, I'm sorry, 1.7 plus 2.9, 4.6 billion for something that they paid $5.2 billion five years prior. The reason I put this guy, Sam Isley, the analyst, he said the announcement was very good for, he said exactly the same thing five years prior at the time of the merger. So don't believe anything analysts say after the fact. They'll make it say, oh, I saw that coming. But this was value destruction. The reason I say that this was the day Eastman Kodak's reputation died is if you look at a case study today of Eastman Kodak, what do you see? You see a carcass of a company, right? You have a name, but there's not much. You go to Rochester, I'm not sure there's anything happening there. But where, to me, when companies make these really big acquisitions and fail, it's not just the money they lose, it's the fact that people stop trusting them. And that's exactly what happened at Eastman Kodak. And guess what? The years after reflected that lack of trust is they found themselves in a deeper and deeper hole. Now this might seem like just one example. Half of all acquisitions are reversed within 10 years of the original acquisition. What Eastman Kodak did at Sterling Drugs was not uncommon. This is more the rule than the exception. Is while there's a lot of fanfare at the time of the acquisition, often the divestiture happens under the radar. You don't even see it happening. Okay? So that's the first example. Let's take a second example. And this one I'm going to use to, exp to kind of talk about how companies explain away the premiums that you pay. So this is HP. Post a child again for a company that is, you know, if you don't want to run a company the right way, HP would be it. the exhibit one. This is how you not run a company. It's a company with a history of bad corporate governance. In fact, one of its CEOs, Mark Hurd, was fired because of inappropriate personal behavior. The board found out two years after the fact. They finally get rid of him. They hired this new guy called Leo Apotheker. I don't know where they found him. He comes in. And he decides he wants to grow HP again. And what does he do? He goes out and buys a UK-based software company called Autonomy. He pays $11.1 .1 billion for the acquisition. It's a company that was trading at $5.9 billion before. And this was one of those few acquisitions where everybody thought he was paying too much. Usually there's some support, so maybe it's okay. They, nobody understood. So here's the way he explained why he went from 5.9 to 11.2. In fact, he did a very elaborate explanation of how he got from the original book value, sort of the accounting value for autonomy, to the 11.1 .1 billion. The original book value is about 2.1 billion for autonomy. So basically, before the acquisition, if you looked at their balance sheet, the accountant's estimate of the value of equity in the company is 2.1 billion. So first thing he did was he called in an accounting firm to reassess the value the accounting value of the assets, the accountants managed to find another $450 million in additional value. Don't ask me how. Magically, the book value went to $2.5 billion. The market attached another premium of $1.3 billion, 
Now, I'm sorry, they added another 2.533 billion to make the book value 4.6 billion. The market, in fact, was adding another 1.3 billion, but on top of that, HP said they could see synergy coming. The synergy was worth 5.2 billion. Okay. Let's see what happened here. This is one of those deals. I have a book called The Worst Deals Ever Made. If any of you want to borrow the book, just, this is a case study of bad deals. This should be exhibit one of a really bad deal. Because two years later, a tar no, HP came back and said, we made a mistake. The company's actually worth only about two billion. <laughs> and here's how they explained it away. They said that they claimed that the whole thing was because of accounting malfunctioning, that they bought a company, the accountants had lied. So the time this happened, and I'll send you the link to this post if you want, I decided to assign blame. If you make a $9 billion mistake, somebody's got to be responsible, right? And that's one of the things about acquisitions that drives me crazy. You have this horrible deal. Everybody said, not my fault, not my fault, not my fault. If it's nobody's fault, how the hell did you make a $9 billion mistake? So I said, okay. It's a mistake here. I'm going to start attaching costs. So here's how I allocated the $9 billion write-off across the different players. First, I started with the synergy. I looked at what happened since the two years. Nothing seemed to have changed. So basically, I said, $4.9 billion of this, the people responsible, the people who originally told me to do this acquisition based on the synergy, it's now gone. So if this were a just world, then H Leo Apotheca should be held accountable for 4.9 billion. Of course, he doesn't have 4.9 billion, but take whatever you can from him. And the secondary culprits have to be the deal bankers who showed me all these synergy forecasts. Where is the synergy? It is true there was some accounting craziness going on. That was about two and a half billion. And I said, well, for that, I'm going to blame autonomy's managers who did the accounting you know, the, for the company and the auditors who went along, and that would have been Deloitte. So now we're at two. After the deal was done, HP ran the company so badly, they managed to write, you know, go through another $1.9 billion in value. So this you can't blame autonomy. This you took over the company and did bad things to them. Lost. So that I said it's got to be the current management of HP because Leo Apotheker actually got replaced by Meg Whitman, who was the new CEO. And I said, well, the, so if you look at this $9 billion, there are lots of people responsible for it. You know how many of them were actually held accountable? Not one. The deal bankers didn't return their fees. The accountants didn't return all the auditing income they made over the years. The managers of the companies didn't lose their jobs. In this case, Meg Whitman continued as CEO. The board of directors went on as if nothing had happened. And that, I think, is the story of many big acquisitions. There's actually substantial evidence that if you look at what drives acquisition premiums, it's not all the logical things about financial considerations and synergy. It's ego. In fact, there's a study that, that came back a long time ago that, from Columbia University where they actually looked at premiums paid on acquisition, tried to explain why are premiums higher in some acquisitions than others, and they discovered the strongest factor explaining differences in premiums across acquisitions was how big the ego was of the CEO of the acquiring company. You know what, how, you say, how do they capture that? They get psychologists to, they actually did a, something very interesting and perhaps not that off the mark. They went into LexisNexis, which used to be the old way you collected data. Before Google, the way you saw how much a company got mentioned or something, you went to LexisNexis and you typed a name, it'll tell you there are 11,000 mentions of this. They typed in each CEO's name and saw how many mentions they got of the CEO's name. And they said, the more mentions of your name, the bigger your ego. <laughs> Not a bad proxy, but they were actually close to the truth because if you've ever been involved in a deal, you realize very quickly that at some point in the deal, you stop thinking about money and you start thinking about winning. It's all about winning the deal, which is, hey, I want to win the deal. And how do you win the deal? You pay the highest price. There's an old, um, you know, there's, in, in, in economics, there's something called the winner's curse in auctions. Have you heard of this? How do you win an auction? By paying the highest price. The next time you see an auction played out on TV or on YouTube, see the auction end, the winner will get up to celebrate, right? 
Why? Because he got exactly what he won. You see the rest of the people in the room also celebrating. <laughs> because every other person in the room thought you were paying too much. By definition, if you win an auction, every other person in the room thinks you paid too much. Maybe they don't know something you do, or maybe you just overpaid. And if it's other people's money, it's so easy, once that process gets started, to overpay. We'll return to this over and over again, because when we talk about capital budgeting, I'm going to argue we have to start thinking about acquisitions as gigantic projects, and ask exactly the questions we would of any other project. Is this a good investment? Should we be investing in this project? Because if we don't, we're going to get the kinds of mistakes you do, as in Eastman Kodak and in HP. So here's the next stop I'd like you to make once you pick your company. That's why I keep pushing you to pick your company. Once you pick your company, I'd like you to take a step back and think about where the power in this company rests. Sounds like a strange question. It's a metaphysical question. Why are we asking this in finance? Power of bourse of vacuum. It's somebody's got the power, and here are your choices. Maybe it's one of those very unusual companies with stockholders. Those people who own shares in the company are actually the ones who have the power in the company. They hire the managers, they fire the managers. Maybe it's one of those companies. It could be a company where managers, for whatever reason, are the ones who essentially make the big decisions. Stockholders have very little power over them. It could be that there are some stockholders who have power and the rest don't. If you think about Facebook, you can already see that there are not all stockholders are made equal. You're a stockholder in Facebook. Mark Zuckerberg is a stockholder in Facebook. As an inside stockholder, he has a lot more power than you do. And because he's tilted the game, and we'll talk about how he tilted the game, he's going to have that power even if he ends up with 20, 15, 12 percent of the shares. So you have inside stockholders, you have outside stockholders, you have managers. You could have Companies where lenders essentially run the company, where banks have essentially, you know, it's unusual, but it can happen. There are companies in Europe where employees sit on the board of directors and could have substantial power over the companies, whether how the companies run. Or there will be cases where the government, even though it might not own very many shares in the company, effectively becomes a power behind the throne. Sounds abstract. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take my companies and take them through the process. So you can see how to do this process, and then you can try this on your company. So let me start with Disney in 2003. I showed you Disney in 97. In 97, Michael Eisner was, imperial, you know, was an imperial CEO. He had complete power of the company. 2003, he was still the CEO. And this is what the top 17 stockholders in Disney look like. I pulled this off Bloomberg. In fact, when you find your company, I'm going to, uh, I'll, I'll send you a little guide to pulling these things off Bloomberg, you know, the Bloomberg terminal. But you can also get them on Yahoo or Google if you're interested. The top 17 stockholders in, in Disney. So I took a look at this list and my stomach dropped. And here's why my stomach dropped. Whenever I look at these lists, I look at it from the perspective of a stockholder in the company. And let's start with the reality check. Now I'll make it about me because I don't want to insult you, but I will never be a controlling stockholder in a company. I don't have enough money. I don't own enough shares. So when I look at this list, I'm saying, is there somebody on this list who's going to be asking the tough questions? Because if I ask questions, I'm going to be ignored. I took a look at this list and no way is anybody on this list going to ask tough questions. And here's why. Every name on this list, barring one, is of an institutional investor, right? And what did we say about institutional investors last session? They tend to go along with managers. We really, really don't like the way a company's run. What do they do? They sell and they move on. They vote with their feet. And, and I don't blame them, but that's the reality. So don't expect Fidelity to be asking tough questions of managers. It's not in their DNA. They're going to just move on and go to another company. So in this, when I look at this, my sense, sense at least when I look at Disney is, that the power is going to lie with managers because none of these large stockholders are going to ask tough questions. You're saying, what about Roy Disney? First, he owns 0.66% of the shares, which he got by inheriting them. And he also happened in 2003 to be a divisional head at Disney. So he was actually working at Disney. So it's very difficult to see him kind of making a big fuss. Though I'll show you what happened in 2004 and 2005 that finally triggered the revolt against Michael Eisner. But in 2003, you look at this list, you say, there's almost no chance that stockholders are going to be able to create change in this company. Let me move on to 
to Vale. And the first thing, the first red flag that I had when I looked at Vale is I noticed there are two classes of shares. This is not uncommon. In fact, in Brazil, this was the way in which almost every publicly traded company until very recently was structured. The shares are called common shares and preferred shares, but it's a little Orwellian in terms of how they're structured. Preferred shares in, in Brazil are actually common shares without voting rights. That's why you're preferred, you have no voting rights. That's why I said it's Orwellian. And then you have common shares which have the voting rights. So basically you have two classes of shares. And if you look at who owns the voting shares, it's held by about seven entities, one of which is BNDES, which is the Brazilian government's big investment fund. In addition, the Brazilian government has what's called a golden share. Have you heard of golden shares? In the 1980s, when Margaret Thatcher was privatizing a lot of UK you know, government companies, one way she was able to get this through, because a lot, of, you know, a lot of people didn't want to privatize them, is she said, we'll keep a golden share in each of these companies. What the golden share allows the government to do is exercise veto power. So with that one share, if the company wants to do an acquisition, you can step in and say no, and that's it. That's the end. So basically, with a golden share, you get big veto power over decisions that a company makes, so you become the power behind the throne. So if you look at Vale, and you're a stockholder, and it's a very cynical view. You call your broker and you say, I want to buy shares in Vale. I'll wager your shares are going to be the non-voting shares, the preferred shares. I own shares in Vale. I'm a realist. I know that there is no chance that anybody at Vale will listen to me. Actually, the CFO at Vale went through this class 10 years ago, so maybe I can try to get him to talk to me. But let's face it, I'm not going to have much power in the company because it's the way the company is structured. You're some of those terrible Brazilians. You've been reading about SNAP, right? How is the, the voting structure in SNAP going to be structured? The IPO is going to happen with, anybody? the shares are going to have no voting rights. That's going to be the weekly puzzle for this week, because I'm, I'm going to trace this back to Google and blame them for the mess we're in. Because for a long time in the US, dual class shares were off the table because the New York Stock Exchange said, if you want to be listed on the New York Stock Exchange, you can't have two classes of shares. In fact, they allowed you know, companies like Ford to be grandfathered in, but for almost 50 years in the US, if you wanted to be listed in the New York, New York Stock Exchange, which used to be the pinnacle for every company's listing existence, they said you can't have, so for a long time in the US, you did not have companies with dual class shares. So if you go back to the 70s and the 80s and you look at tech companies that went public then, they all had one class of shares and every share had the same voting rights. Then along came first the 1990s where people said, we don't have to be in the New York Stock Exchange. It's okay, we're on the NASDAQ. We have some really big companies in the NASDAQ. So all of a sudden, the glory of being on the New York Stock Exchange faded. And the NASDAQ actually decided that this was a competitive advantage they had. They could go to young tech companies and say, you can have two classes of shares. We allow it. The NYSE doesn't. Why don't you stay listed with us? So you started to see in the 90s companies starting this process, but most of them are small companies, they're under the radar. Then you got to Google in the, in the early part of the last decade. They decided to go public and they break the rules in two very big ways. The first thing they did was actually, well, how, did, how was the Google IPO structure that made it very different from any other IPO? It was the first Dutch auction. They said, why are we hiring these investment bankers to make up prices that are well below the value and deliver that price and collect? 6%. So I actually think that was a good idea. They went with the Dutch auction saying, well, you know, more people have heard of Google than Goldman Sachs. It's not like I have to worry about nobody knowing who I am. So they did a Dutch auction. The second thing they did was they created two classes of shares. Class A shares, which are going to be held by Bryn and Page, would have 10 times the voting rights of Class B shares. And I remember at that time when it happened, I expected portfolio managers to raise a hue and cry. This was a big IPO. Here was a company saying, hey, you're not going to get voting rights. You'd think that institutional investors would wake up and say, no, that's not right. We're going to discount the shares tremendously. And I remember talking to one of the, invest one of the, the, the investment, uh, the, one of the portfolio managers who actually invested in that original IPO. I asked him, how come you guys are letting this go by? And his response was, hey, they're a good management team. 
So what difference does it make whether we have voting rights or not? They're going to run the company well. And that at the core is what many of these social media companies are exploiting. So when you're Facebook and you go public, you say, that Zuckerberg guy is such a smart guy. He's going to run this company. And of course, in Silicon Valley, there's this founder worship almost there. You say, if you're a founder, you cannot make bad decisions. You can't let these you know, rabble raise questions about how you're running the company. You should be a dictator. And you listen to it often enough, you say, well, those stockholders, they know nothing. They're going to ask me short-term questions. I'm a long-term guy. So once Google opened that door, you started to see all these social media companies go through. Most social media companies are structured with two classes of shares. In fact, Google and Facebook have taken this one extra step. You know what Google did a few years ago? Not just content giving you one-tenth of the voting rights, they decide to create Class C shares on which you get no voting rights. Soon I expect them to come up with Class D shares, we have negative voting rights. <laughs> Once they have your face, they're rubbing it into the dirt, Why? and you're enjoying it, they rub it more, they're going to find more ways to insult you. But in a sense, we've opened this Pandora's box here. And the reality is, whether you like it or not, when you create two class of shares, you are, in fact, tilting the power towards the incumbent managers. So what can go wrong? I have one word, Viacom. Third of Viacom? Two classes of shares. In the mid-'80s, it was run by this guy. It was a really shrewd guy called Sumner Redstone. And the institutional investors who told me the same thing about Bryn and Page said, hey, that Redstone guy is such a smart guy. That guy is now 93 years old. We're not even sure whether his brain function is, is there or not. But because he owns the voting shares, Viacom has been split asunder in the last year because of the fight. So I've linked to that. So take a look at, so think of that as the, the scenario that could unfold. You think that can never happen at Facebook? How do you know? I mean, these founders are really smart people, but they're also human beings. If there's no check put on them, they're going to essentially take their worst instincts sometimes and let it run. And if you've given away that power to operate as a stop, don't come. I mean, complaining that marks, if, if you buy shares in Facebook, no, and you complain about Mark Zuckerberg not listening to you, that's like getting married to Kim Kardashian and complaining there are a lot of cameras around you all the time. It's expected that's exactly what you, will, that you should see in these companies. These founders will run these companies as if they're private businesses. Yes? How does that affect the uh, share price? That's, that's a very good question. The question is, when you issue these low voting right shares, how does it affect the share prices? If we want companies to stop doing this, what should we do? We should discount these shares by 30, 40, 50 percent, right? The median discount is about 5%. Many of these companies, there's almost no discount. There are investors who are OK with it. Okay? In fact, it's starting with Google, the Class C shares, finally you're starting to see a 10% discount in the Class B shares. But that took a long time for, for it to happen. But that's a very good question. That should be the trade-off we put in front of Evan Spiegel. right? Because if we say, look, by giving up voting rights, you're going to get 20% less per share. That's going to make them think about how much do I value control. And I'll give you my cynical answer. Many of these people value control so much that they'll take a 20% discount on the shares just to keep control of the company. So that's, I think, all you can do as an investor is if you see the game is fixed, you've got to price in that fixing into the share price. and you see that playing out. So we'll talk about how that difference can vary depending on how much you trust the manager. So today there might be very little discount on Facebook's low voting rights shares. But if Facebook does a $100 billion acquisition after which the stock price drops 20%, you're going to start to see that difference start to vary because now you can say, now I see why I should have kept the voting rights. It's too late to go back and fix the problem. But that's the only way you can get the attention of companies that insist. I mean, it's it's... Basically, when, when companies issue non-voting shares, what do they say? I want your money, but I don't want your input, right? That's basically it. They treat you as a capital provider. If the definition of a shareholder is you're part owner of the company, you can let go of that. You're not a part owner of the company. Let's move on. 
focus on the Tata Motors top stock order. So I went in to Bloomberg, I printed off the top 17, and I noticed something very interesting. I saw a lot of Tatas on there. Not individuals, but other Tata companies. So let me ask you a question. This is not uncommon. When you buy shares in a family group company, pretty much anywhere in the world, you're going to see other family group companies among the top shareholders. How does that happen? Until about 30 years ago, the Tata group was almost entirely a privately held group, right? So here's how it would work. If Tata Motors had a really good year and Tata Steel wanted to build a new plant, the family would use the internal capital market. Tata Motors would invest money in Tata Steel. It's not a bad thing to do. That's the only way you could get capital. And the accountant would say, okay, in return you get 17,000 shares, basically, because there's got to be a debit and a credit. So you'd get... So the older a family group company is, the more you're going to see. This is not some grand conspiracy. This is a reflection of history. And there's a consequence. If you look at Tata Motors, about 30% of the shares are held by other Tata entities. So let's say you don't like the way Tata Motors is run. You don't think that cheapest car in the world, Nano, is such a good idea. You want to change minds there. You get this in front of the annual meeting. You say, I'm going to get 51% of the shareholders to vote against it. You can already see how the dice are loaded against you, right? Because 30% of the shares are voted by other Tata companies, and they're going to vote essentially what... You know, in fact, all the Tata companies share one building in Mumbai. As it's called Mumbai House. So basically, the second floor is Tata Motors, third floor is Tata Steel, and the very top sits the patriarch until 2012. That used to be Rotten Tata. Do you think any big decision can happen on those first 23 floors, say 15 floors or whatever it is, without the guy at the top saying that's okay? Again, I, there's no conspiracy, but what's, you're going to see what Tata Motors, and you're going to see this play out during this class, is what Tata Motors often does is in the best interest of the group rather than in the best interest of the company. And that's a little unfair because when you and I buy shares, we buy shares in individual companies. We expect them to be run in our best interest. I'm saying let go of that. Because if you're a family group company, the family group's interests are going to come first. And in 2013, when I did this, and when I did this in 2014, there was actually somebody in the front row who had who actually worked in the Tata group. And he put up his hand and said, but this is the Tata group. And if those of you who know, who know the history of family groups in India, the Tata Group is one of the oldest and most reputable. It's had only seven CEOs, if you read the first week. over. It's, it's, a, it's considered to be a good family group. So he was saying, but it's okay with this group, right? If it was a reliance group, I understand. I don't trust the Ambani's. But this is a Tata Group. They're such cultured, noble people. They wouldn't do something. And it was all, I mean, I, I hate to wish bad things on a company. Actually, I don't hate, I sometimes <laughs> like to wish bad things on a company. But this is actually what happened in 2016 to the Tata Group, is grist for the mill. The next edition of this book is going to be a lot more fun to write, because now I can write the postscript. And what happened in October of 2016 is, remember Ratan Tata, the, the patriarch in 2012? In 2012, he finally passed the baton on to Cyrus Mystery. At first I think somebody not, he's related to the Tardis, but you know, he's a young smart guy brought in as the, the head of the, the Tardis, the, 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 the top of the group, basically. And on October 24th of 2016, he was told by somebody, you know, so this is Cyrus Mystery was told that he had been fired. And he didn't leave easily or quickly, so over the, Last three months, that fight's been playing out, not just in the business press, but in the popular press in India. And it's decimated about 15% of the market cap of all Tata companies over that period. And if you're a Tata stockholder, you're saying, this is so unfair. Why am I being punished for the family group fight? This is exactly what you buy into, whether you like it or not, when you buy a family group company. So even if you think a family group is trustworthy and you like them, whether you like it or not, your fate is in the hands of that group more than... So this is not a traditional corporate governance problem because of the way the company is structured. So let me close with what to me is the most daunting example of lack of power. Baidu. 
Baidu, as I said, is a Chinese search engine. It makes all its revenues in China. I've never talked to anybody who's not from China who's even heard of Baidu. So this isn't like some global search engine. This is a Chinese search engine that gets all of its revenues in China. It gets listed, it gets listed on the NASDAQ. Why? Well, this is one of those strange things about this sphere of companies in China. Technically, they're covered by laws that restrict them from selling shares to non-Chinese. So if they tried to issue shares in Shanghai, it, they'd have been breaking the law. So what did they do? They decided to issue the shares. This seems like you know, it's a loophole, right? But the, they couldn't actually issue the shares on the NASDAQ directly. They had to create a shell company in the Cayman Islands which issued the shares. So this is actually true for Alibaba as well. So when you buy shares in Baidu, what are you buying shares in? A shell company in the Cayman Islands, which has an agreement with the Chinese company that's technically illegal. So if the Chinese government actually read the law, you know, they could t tomorrow wake up and say, you know what, this operating agreement, it's worth nothing. In which case, what do you end up with shares in? a shell company in the Cayman Islands. Try liquidating that company and seeing what you get. I don't even know whether they hang a shingle in the Cayman Islands. Maybe that shingle will go on eBay for $15. But you're paying $200 billion for Alibaba for a company that is really a shell company and hoping and praying that the operating agreement holds. But here's the final catch. Alibaba is run by Jack Ma. Let's be completely honest. This is Jack Ma's company. You and I are in the outhouse saying, can you listen to me? Can you hear me? He says, no, you're in the outhouse. Just give me your capital and go away. He's a smart guy. We can talk about how smart he is. But it is Jack Ma's company. And it's run by 19 people that he's handpicked. You don't like those 19 people? Tough. Sell your stock and move on. There's not a whole lot you can do. There is zero corporate governance here. Your capital providers to Alibaba and Baidu, let's be open and honest about it. If you're okay with it, you can still make money, and I'm not saying you cannot, but don't do it on the pretense that you're somehow a shareholder in Alibaba who can change the way Alibaba is run, because all you can do if you don't like the way the company is run is sell the shares and move on. So in a sense, these are almost horror stories when it comes to corporate governance. But let me close this process off by showing you Disney in 2009. So in Disney in 2003, we looked at the top 17 investors. 16 were institutional investors who voted with their feet, and the other was Roy Disney, right? Disney in 2009. Who's on top of the list? How did Steve Jobs become the largest stockholder in Disney in 2009? because he owns 60% of Pixar, and when Disney bought Pixar, they paid in shares, and overnight, Steve Jobs became the largest stockholder by far in Disney. This is never about Steve Jobs, it's about me. So if I'm a stockholder in Disney in 2009, do I feel a little better than I did in 2003? Yeah, and I'll tell you why. Steve Jobs is not thinking about what's good for me. Let's, let's be completely honest. I'm not even in his radar of existence. So it, but the one thing you worry about as a stockholder in entertainment companies is inertia, which is they do the things they've always done. And Disney, more than any other entertainment company, has a whole host of inertias to fight, right? It's got the Walt Disney tradition. It's got those theme parks. It's been doing things the same way. And if you're a stockholder, you worry about the fact that they get too caught up in this inertia, nobody on the board would ask questions about changing the way they do things. Now do you see why in 2009 I felt a little better about the board of directors? Now Steve Jobs on the board of, is on the board of directors. As I said, he doesn't care about me, but let's face it, if you were asked to describe Steve Jobs, you wouldn't, the two words you wouldn't use is go along and get along kind of guy, right? So if he's at the board meeting and you know, Bob Iger gets up and says, we're going to produce three movies a year, we're going to use this, uh, you know, the traditional distribution mechanism, if he feels this is not the way the business is evolving, even if he didn't own the 7%, he's probably going to speak up. That's all you want is somebody pushing back. And in this case, at least I have a little better chance that somebody might push back against the manager and somebody with 7% of the shares. I'm not going to get overexcited. It's not like this changes the entire game, but at least I have a semblance of hope here. 
that somebody will push back against management. And that's all you're looking for, is when you look at your top 17 stockholders, and please God, let there be one person on this group, in this group, who will ask tough questions of management. Because if you can get somebody pushing back, you at least have a chance of having a debate going about what to invest in, whether to do that acquisition, how much to borrow, how much to return to stockholders. And as shareholders, you need a say in that process. So when you get a chance, take a look at your company and try to address the question. Again, it's not a question that is easy to answer. It's subjective. And that's going to make you uncomfortable. But all I'm asking, give me a sense of how much power you would have as a stockholder in the company. And in a case like Alibaba, that's going to be very easy. You're going to say, I have no power. But if you are a company like Coca-Cola, it's going to be a little messier. And you see why? Who's the largest stockholder in Coca-Cola? It's Berkshire Hathaway. And for a long time, people have held on to that as their semblance of hope. Why? Because you're saying, well, Warren Buffett's going to be asking questions. Two problems. One is Warren Buffett is the best friend of every management that he invests in. That's, a, that's not a, a, a strike. I mean, that, I don't view that as a critique of him. That's the way he invests. He invests in companies where he likes the management, whether it's the Washington Post or, or Coca-Cola. In fact, he's gotten to some trouble because of his closeness to managers. That's the first problem. The other is he's 88 years old. I hate to be morbid, but 88-year-olds are not, you can't count on 88-year-olds holding your side of the bargain for the next 10 years. It's not going to happen. So with Coca-Cola, I look at that list and say, hmm, there's Berkshire Hathaway on top. It's not like Warren Buffett showing up at every meeting and asking tough questions. But essentially, that's, that's the judgment call you want to make. And you know what should make you really happy? It's to see a Pershing Square on the list. Who's behind Pershing Square? That's Bill Ackman. All of these. Or, you know, so basically as you go through, in fact, I'll send you a list of, none of them uses their own name, Bill Ackman, Carl Icahn, they all have a front. Why do you want them on the list? Not because they're nice people. In fact, they're, you want them on the list because they're not nice people. Because they're going to get in managers' faces and ask questions. It's not that they're right all the time. Carl Icahn says some really stupid things about Apple, but I'm glad he's there because as an Apple stockholder, I'm glad he's the one raising the questions because if he didn't, who is? Right? I can't raise the questions. I don't have the power. So you're looking for something to hang your hat on saying, hey, maybe something good will come out of that. So let's move to the second linkage between stockholders and bondholders. Let me review what we assumed in the utopian world. In the utopian world, I assume that if you lend money to a company, and you don't protect yourself, what happens to you? Nothing bad. So let's get real. You guys be equity investors in the company. You guys be the bank. They got the fun job, but somebody's got to do the dirty job. So they're going to come to borrow money from you. Ready? Let's go over to borrow money. As, as we describe what we're going to invest in with this borrowed money, I'm going to describe this as safe or risky. What should we tell the bank? Oh, it's a safe. We're going to invest in safe projects, right? So let's say you're a trusting banker, which is an oxymoron. <laughs> you, say, you, you look honest, and you lend one billion to us because we told you we're going to take risky projects, no strings attached. So now we have a billion dollars of the bank's money. We told them we were going to take safe projects, right? But there's no contract backing that up. So let me ask you some questions. Could you pay the billion dollars as dividends to yourself? Sure, why not? Could buy back stock. You could take really risky projects. That's why trusting bankers are oxymorons. You lend money to companies on trust, they're going to take you to the cleaners. So you could, in fact, take, you know, have buybacks, have risk shifting. That's what taking riskier projects is. You could even go out and borrow more money in the company and push the bankers' loans to the back because, in a sense, you can secure that new loan you took with your best assets and the bankers waiting at the end. You're saying, but what if it's a reputable company? That's what bankers often say. Well, I'm lending to Coca-Cola. They're not going to do something like this. And for a long time in the US, that was our basis for buying corporate bonds until the early 1980s, the mid-1980s even. If you bought corporate bonds in the US, you had absolutely no protection. A corporate bondholder is like a banker, right? 
You were trusting companies to do the right thing, but you said, but this is such a reputable company. So I have a sad but true story to tell you if you believe that lending to a reputable company is going to protect you. It's a Nabisco story. So to add some flesh to the story, I'm going to take you back in time to the early 1980s. You've just turned 65. And you've retired. You moved to Florida. Doesn't everybody. You live on a golf course. And you have a half a million dollars in savings. So you come to me and I'm your broker. I say, look, I have a half a million dollars in savings. I need to invest it somewhere. So I suggest a nice mutual fund, a Vanguard 500 index fund. You say, no, no, too risky. I'm a retired person. I can't afford to invest in stocks. I suggest some T-bonds. She says, that looks pretty safe. But then I tell you what coupon you will make. So that won't cover my golf fees, so that's not enough. So I suggest some nice corporate bonds. Initially, you're a little nervous because you've heard that corporations. But I tell you, but I'm sure you've heard of this corporation. It's called RJR Nabisco. You say, yeah, I've seen the name all over the grocery store. They're a big company, right? Yes. They've been around a long time. Yes. And to give you final comfort, I also tell you that they're rated. You have no idea what I'm talking about. But I said, these are these ratings agencies in New York that tell you how much risk there is. And they're rated double A. And no double A rated company has gone bankrupt while it was rated double A. I'm a very careful broker. Technically, that's true. <laughs> so you put your half a million dollars in the Bisco bonds and you go back to the golf course for about three or four years. The coupons roll in, you get the check in the mail. One day in, in 1987, you come back from a golf game. You open up the Wall Street Journal and you see a headline. KKR does LBO of RJR. You have no idea what all these acronyms stand for. <laughs> but you see the RJR and you freak out. So you call me and say, what happened? I said, technically nothing. <laughs> Remember those bonds you had yesterday? You still have them. Remember the coupon you were promised yesterday? You still have the same coupon. But this outfit called KKR from New York has come in and borrowed five times more money than Nabisco used to have. And remember that? rating that I told you about, the double A, you're still in the alphabet, <laughs> but you've slipped. You're now a double B rated company. So what the heck does that mean? Well, double B rated companies default all the time, which means a coupon you are promised might or might not come. So don't get worried. If the checks don't come, they just don't come. Saying, what does this all mean? Well, if you bought corporate bonds the day before the LBO, or a week before, or a year before, or four years before, and the coupon rate was set based on the fact that you were a double A rated company, and now you become a double B rated company, what's the only mechanism you have in the bond market to adjust for this higher risk? You lower the price on the day of the LBO. The same day where the equity investors in Nabisco were doing the happy dance, you lost 20% of your money. You think, this is so unfair. Hey, you didn't protect yourself. How would you have protected yourself? Give me some logical ways in which I could have written in some protection. What was, what was the, the thing that exposed you? That you agreed to lend to this company, it was a double A rated company. Then they did something incredibly, that, this is self done, right? It's not the outside world. You did an LBO. And when you did the LBO and your rating went from double A to double B, I was stuck with a double A rating. What would you have done? One is you could have done what bankers do, which is once they borrowed money, you can't borrow money, more money. That's a little too constraining for companies. Is there something more flexible you could have done? Yeah. Have somebody on the board, but remember, if you're on the board, your job is to watch out for the fiduciary interests of shareholders. They did their fiduciary responsibility, right? So unless you can get the Delaware courts to see the world the way, the world the way you see it, it's going to be really tough to do. Yeah. I'm sorry? Oh, this is the 1980s. So that's not even on the. And remember, to do that, what do you have? So when you say, well, no, why can't I buy protection? To get protection, you have to know that things, bad things are happening. So by the time you found out bad things happened, probably been too late. Right? You could actually have put something into the bond that said, if you do something like an LBO, I will either get a new interest rate based on your new rating. That sounds fair, right? Because you'd lowered your rating. Or I will, you've basically broken the contract with me, right? I will come and put the bonds back to you. 
and collect my fair value, face value, which is the $1,000. In other words, let's redo the contract. In fact, post Nabisco, a lot of corporate bonds issued in the US became puttable bonds. Puttable bonds in the sense investors could put the bond back. It came with this change of control provision. So if something like an LBO happened, you're saying too late to protect you on Nabisco, you're right. But bond markets learned. But if you don't protect yourself, this is something you're going to expose it to. So that's why I said we're going to introduce the word Nabisco into the corporate finance lexicon from now on, which is if you invest in bonds in a company, you lend money to a company and you don't protect yourself, you are going to get nabisco It's not a question of whether, it's a question of when. So second link, as you can already see, that if you're not careful, one of the ways in which I can increase my stock price is by ripping off my bond orders. It's a one-time game, but it might be a big enough one-time game that I'm okay with it. Which brings me to my third link. Right in the utopian world, what did you as managers do when something bad happened to you? You ran out to the markets and you told the truth right away, right? And what did markets do? The trading room was full of polite intellectuals assessing what you just did and revaluing your company. Let's get real here. Mar managers don't always tell the truth. Let's put that on the table. And even when they do, they sometimes try to arrange when they tell the truth. It's human nature, if you think about it, right? How many of you are married? Let's say something bad happens during the course of today. I'm not going to get home at 6 o'clock, open the door, Hannah, I have something bad that I need to tell you. If you have something bad that you need to tell your spouse, you do one of two things. You look for a good time. Not now, not now, window of opportunity closed. Maybe when she's sleeping, I'll whisper it to her. <laughs> I've done it lots of times, I told you last night. You were sleeping, I didn't know that. So the first strategy you adopt, if you have bad news, is you wait for a good time. The second is you try to bundle it, right? Hence the term, I have some good news and I have some bad news. Bad news was that this morning when I was going to the train station, I wrapped the car around a tree. <laughs> the good news is I switched to Geico. <laughs> Too late, no, but, but in a sense, you see companies do this all the time. What I'm trying to say is companies don't always lie, but they try to kind of package the information in a way that they think is best for them. So it is true that there are, you know, so for most companies, when I think about information, it's more about this process of delaying and packaging information rather than outright lies. That doesn't mean there are some companies that don't just lie. Here's one of my favorite examples. It's a Canadian gold mining company that used to be called Briex. It's out of business now. One of the hardest gold mining companies that was listed in, in, the, in North America during the 80s and the 90s. Most highly touted companies. It claimed to have found the largest gold reserve in the world somewhere in Indonesia. In fact, it flew equity research analysts out from New York to that gold reserve. And before they got there, it salted the earth with gold dust. I'm not kidding. This is a real story. And when they got there, they said, look, there's so much gold under the ground, it's coming out. <laughs> Let's face it. If you're a gold analyst, you've never actually seen a gold mine, right? You probably think gold comes in coins. It comes in ingots. What is this mine thing? So these analysts all run back, buy recommend, buy the stock. There's so much gold under the ground, it's coming out of the ground. Stock gets pushed up. Some you know, day in 1996, when the geologist who worked for the company, who had originally found the gold mine, jumps out of a plane at 32,000 feet without a parachute. But nothing good can happen to you. Nothing good happened to this guy. He kind of splattered. <laughs> and of course, the next day, people start asking, well, why would this guy jump out of a plane? Was he depressed? And over the next few weeks, the company starts sending out dribs of information. They look, remember that? You know, billion tons of gold, we said. It's only 100 million, then it became 10 million. Finally, they admitted there was no gold. The whole thing had been a fraud that they'd pulled off for an entire decade. That is outright fraud. It doesn't happen that often, thank God, but it does happen. Oh, here's another example. A company called Mercury Finance in the late 90s. I used to lend money to people with bad credits. It's not a bad business. You charge a high enough interest rate, you can do it. So I open up the Wall Street Journal, there's a little news story about Mercury Finance. And here's how it goes. 
Mercury Finance announces it cannot find its CFO. That's what it says. The guy's gone missing. You know, we've looked everywhere. We looked in his office. We looked in his apartment. We looked under his desk. He's gone. And then you keep reading the story, and towards the end of the story, it says half our cash balance seems to also have left. <laughs> so somebody's having a lot of fun somewhere, but it's not you and I as shareholders. It's the CFO. That's outright fraud. But those still remain the exceptions in the US. They're not the rule. The rule, though, is this managing of information. So I'll give you some evidence on the managing of information. It comes, it, go, it comes from a paper I wrote about 30 years ago and I actually used to do academic research. You know how that works? You spend years of your life looking at questions that nobody cares about. You write a paper that gets published in a journal that nobody reads. I kind of gave up on this about 15 years ago, but, but 30 years ago I had to do this. So this is one of my first papers. I actually looked at earnings and dividend announcements made by US companies and I classified them by day of the week. Incredibly creative instincts kicking in, right? So I look at Monday announcements, Tuesday, and basically I want to see what do earnings announcements contain? Good news or bad news? On, and if you look at the days of the week, Monday through Thursday all look about the same, right? On average, good news, not huge good news, but good news. Then you get to Fridays, and horrible things happen to companies on Fridays. <laughs> So I took a look at the Friday announcements to see when on Friday the horrible things started happening. And I noticed a pattern. Until about 4 o'clock, everything was hunky-dory. Around 4.01, 4.02, horrible things happened. If you don't believe me, this Friday, wait till 4 o'clock. And what's so magical about 4 o'clock? Close of trading. Remember your spouse sleeping is the best time to tell bad news? <laughs> This is analogous to your spouse sleeping. The market's sleeping. Let's whisper the news to them. Let's see JP Morgan say, oh, London offices lost seven billion on some kind of fish. Maybe a whale. <laughs> After close of trading, what you're hoping is that by the time people come back on Monday, that they've forgotten that you lost seven billion dollars. It never works. <laughs> so guess how this manifests itself. For the last 85 years in the US, Every single year, guess what the worst day of the week for investors to invest in the stock market is? Monday. Why? Because Friday, it's too late, right? So the bad news comes out. You wake up Monday morning and you pummel the stock. You say, I thought you thought I'd forget over a weekend that you lost seven billion. It's not going to happen. But companies keep trying this. They keep trying to manage the flow of information. It's almost hopeless if you think about it, right? Because markets start to gauge what you're doing. In fact, this, here's the other way it manifests itself. You know that companies report earnings, the, their quarterly earnings on pretty much the same day every year. It's very predictable. If it's February 16th, unless it happens to be a weekend, next February 16th, you'll see the announcement come out. But once in a while, you'll see a company's earnings announcement day come and go. And then come and go. You know, two days, three days. You know what starts to happen to the stock price each day? It starts dropping and dropping. Because what's the market saying? Hey, you're three days late. You don't you know, wait three days for good news to come out. It's going to be bad news. We're going to knock the price down. So in a sense, this is a game where you think you're controlling the game, but the market often is getting ahead of you. I think it's often in the best interest of companies to go out and give the bad news to the market and let them deal with it. But it's not advice that most managers take, you know, take to heart. So let's look at why people have such problems with markets. And this is, when I say people, lots of people, even in markets, don't trust markets. And let's face it, lots of these founder CEOs, one of the reasons they want those voting shares is because they don't trust markets. So let me play devil's advocate. Let's look at the critiques of markets. The first is, let's face it, markets sometimes do some crazy things. I, what I call the Elvis Presley test for markets. You ready? Let me test, try the test out on you. You've heard of Elvis, right? Everybody's heard of Elvis. How many of you think Elvis is still alive? OK, good. You all passed the test. You say, I think he's alive, but if I put up my hand, they might kick me out of the MBA program. No, whatever it is. He died in like 1977. Now let me shift gears. This is the second test, which has nothing to do with you, so you can relax. If you're in USA today, it's like a McDonald's version of a newspaper. <laughs> okay? 
basically, if you want to read the paper in 10 minutes, you can just skim through the USA Today. Nothing will kind of crimp your style, just go through. <laughs> but every day they're in a poll. And that's 250 polls every year. They, they're, they're not printed in the weekend, so it's two, that's a lot of polls. Then you got run, they run out of questions. So they start asking questions like, do you like lettuce on your burger? 67% of Americans said yes. 26% said no. 7% said I don't know. No matter what the poll is, have you noticed there's a 7% floating? I don't know. <laughs> Americans were asked, do you know what your name is? 93% said yes. 7% said I don't know. <laughs> right? So this is 1992. On the 15th anniversary of Elvis's death, they asked this question, do you think Elvis is still alive? 71% of Americans say no, thank God for small blessings. 22% say yes. And 7% of course said, I don't know. <laughs> so let's set that 7% as paranoid, but right, the paranoid and rational don't always clash, right? So maybe they're doing the right thing. But 22% of Americans in 1992 thought Elvis was still alive. It's a population in the US, 300 million. 22, that's 66 million people walking around thinking Elvis <laughs> is still alive. And what are we assuming? That when news comes out about a company, people take that, they estimate the expected cash flows for the next 10 years, adjust the risk, discount it back, then, come on, 66 million people were thinking, walking around thinking Elvis is still alive. News comes out. Of course, if you ask New Yorkers where these people are, they have this nasty habit of consigning them to the Midwest. Have you noticed this? <laughs> One of those I states, Indiana, Illinois, Iowa, somewhere there. Let's face it, though, if you stood outside the floor of the exchange and you ask those traders as they come out, do you think a disproportionately large number of those traders probably think Elvis is still alive? This is something I'm going to come back to again and again, because when we do corporate finance, we often say, if you do this, your value as a company will increase by 10%. And when you present this to managers, you know what the next question to you is going to be? Does that mean my stock price will go up 10% as well? And that's when I want you to tell them. Remember, there are 66 million people walking around thinking Elvis is still alive. I can't tell you what the price is going to do at any point in time because the price can do crazy things. So I trust markets more than most, but I also do it with a grain of salt. I know that markets can do some really crazy things. So trying to explain on any given day what markets do can be one of the most dangerous exercises, because you're trying to give it a rational explanation for something for which there might not be one. And of course, there are other ways in which people contest whether markets are rational. They say markets move too much relative to underlying value. This was, in fact, what made Robert Schiller famous. In the 1980s, he showed the evidence that if you look at the present value of dividends, which presumably is what you get from stocks, that present value moves like this. But if you look at stock prices, they move like this. Therefore, that became the basis for his irrational markets, which he then converted into irrational exuberance and the bubble story that he tells. But essentially, there are people who are very bright people who look at markets and say, you know what, markets are probably a little crazy. There's also evidence that markets sometimes overreact to news, especially if it's big news in either direction. If it's bad news, the price drops too much, a bad earnings announcement. Last week, Amazon lost 4% of its value. Doesn't sound like much, but when you're a $400 billion company, 4% of your value is $16 billion in one day. Say, well, that was too much. And there is some evidence looking at history that markets do overreact. So there is this pretty reasonable case you can make that trusting markets can be dangerous because markets sometimes do crazy things. Markets sometimes overreact, sometimes underreact, sometimes don't behave the way they should. But let me push back a little bit. And I'm gonna put you on the spot because this is I think at the core of what is gonna drive what you think about the SNAP IPO or what do you think about Facebook. So I'm going to read some statements here. There's no right answer, so don't think about the answer I want you to give me. I want you to get the answer from your gut. So here's my first statement. Focusing on market prices will lead companies toward short-term decisions at the expense of the long term. Agree or disagree? You don't have to tell me, as I said. Just think for yourself. How many of you would uh, 
would agree with that statement, that focusing on market price will make it short term. Come on, you can be honest. It's, you know, I'm not, as I said, I'm not holding a holder to it. So this is a corporate finance class. And your MBAs, if you think about what percentage of the people in this room think markets are short term, and you think about that this is, this is probably more the rule than the exception. 80% of people will probably agree with you. Now let me ask you a second question, because this is going to be, yeah. in fact, I would agree with you. Sometimes markets are really short term. But if you don't trust markets, who are you trusting instead? You're trusting managers. So here's my second question to you. Allowing managers to make decisions without having to worry about markets will lead to better long-term decisions. That's, I think, at the core of what you think about corporate governance. If your answer to that question, if, if, your, if your response to that statement is, I agree, then you're going to be OK with SNAP doing what they're doing, right? Because what are they doing? They're loading power with a founder manager. And you're saying, that guy's probably going to do the right things. So why should we give stockholders power? Okay. So as I said, be honest with yourself, because this is going to percolate up to the, pro uh, the top again when we start talking about the specifics in corporate finance, is you've got to resolve for yourself where you stand on this. And finally, I'll read a statement. Neither managers nor markets are, sh are trustworthy. Therefore, we need somebody from the outside imposing discipline on companies. That would, if you say, if you agree with that, what is, where is that going to lead you to? It's going to lead you to a central entity saying you can do this, you can't do this. So again, if you look at every corporate governance structure in the world, somewhere in there is a belief about markets. And that belief about markets is what you need to kind of be clear about. I've already told you that I don't trust markets to do the right thing at every point in time. I'll tell you why I still trust markets more than managers. Because one of the arguments here about markets is they're short term, right? Let me give you some counter evidence. If markets are so short term, then how do you explain the fact that SNAP's going to be priced at 20 to 25 billion? I mean, the essence of short term is, hey, are you making money now? Here's a company that has a half a billion dollars in revenues and has more than that in operating losses. There's nothing there. If markets were truly short term, how do you see the prices you see for all these young growth companies? In fact, if you look at the evidence, it actually cuts in the other direction. It's that markets reward growth too much, not too little, and reward existing cash flows too little. In other words, the PE ratios for mature companies are too low. The PE ratios for high growth companies are too high. So if there's a case to be made, it's that sometimes markets are far too long term. They're encouraging you to be, do things that perhaps you shouldn't be doing by saying growth is good. In fact, there's some very tangible evidence that markets are not that caught up with current earnings. And it shows up when companies make big investment announcements. Because think of what happens when you make a big investment announcement. You're spending three billion, five billion. In fact, Snap's just said they're gonna spend three billion lining up server space on Google for future user growth. And you know why they have to do it, right? Because Facebook and Twitter own their own server space, but Snap actually pays for server space when they have more. So, they have, so they're spending $3 billion. That should be bad if you're short term, right? And if you look at what markets do when you make these big investment announcements, it is not consistent with the story that I hear of markets being short term. In fact, on average, when companies make these, so this is basically on the, on the announcement day, and in the announcement month, around big announcements. So when you make, a, a, for instance, an R&D investment, on the day you announce the R&D expenditure, your stock price goes up by maybe 0.2%. That doesn't sound like much. But remember, this is an announcement for a big company. And in the month after, it goes up about 1.6%. For the most part, when companies make big investment announcements, markets don't punish them. They reward them. That's not consistent with the short-term market to me. Does that mean every company that makes a big announcement is going to be rewarded. If HP says they're going to do another $9 billion acquisition, what's your first reaction? Knock off 30% of the stock price because I know what you guys have done in the past. It is natural for markets to be skeptical when some companies go out and make announcements. In fact, it's interesting. The one class of announcements where you don't see sustained price increases is the strategy announcements. Because let's face it, there's really nothing tangible you're doing, other than saying, we have a new strategy. Until you do something tangible, the market's saying, let's show me. But in general, markets are more long-term. 
than people make them out to be. And ma marriage is a lot more short term than they make themselves out to be. So if you ask me to trust which of these two groups I'd go along with, I'd put my bets with the market. In fact, what is the market's uh, over under yesterday in the Super Bowl? Do you know? It's 56 and a half points. I remember sitting in the first quarter and saying, this is a stupid market. You ended up with what, 62? And it is in the market's initial, the New England Patriots were run by three points. That looked like a you know, definite loss at the end of the first half. They won by six. Markets are surprising in terms of how they deliver results. So I'm constantly amazed at what markets do on a day-to-day -day basis. That doesn't mean that everything they do is going to be right. But the very fact that you can take all of this information and end up with a market clearing price amazes me day in and day out. Of course, when, you, you know, when I taught this class in 2009, the question I was asked was, do you trust markets still? Because the underlying theme there was, look what markets did to us last year. I think you're mistaking cause and effect. Markets didn't do bad things in 2008. It's that banks went out and did stupid things, and markets finally adjusted. It took them a while. It, they, maybe they should have done it in 2007 and 2006. But when you look at, to me, what happened in that last quarter of 2008 was really indicative of how much this, there's a song, I forget who sings it, You Miss Me When I'm Gone. Who, who does it? Ariana Grande or somebody? You know, say, same thing with, with markets. You miss me when I'm gone, and I missed them in the last quarter of 2008 because what, why was it a crisis? Because when GE tried to issue commercial paper, the market had shut down. When you tried to sell your, short, you know, your stocks, the market had shut down. We didn't realize how much we needed markets till we lost them. Try operating. In an environment where markets shut down, you're very quickly going to realize how much we use markets as a crutch. So much as we like to take it out on markets, you made a mistake on that one, imagine a world where you didn't have markets and you're very quickly going to see that without that liquidity that markets provide, lots of things companies do will become impossible. So I'm not a, I don't have blind faith in markets, but I have more faith in markets than I do in the alternatives still. And that's what leaves, leads me still to a market-based solution, because even though markets can be wrong, they have no ego. So when they're wrong and they find out they're wrong, the price adjusts back again. Managers have egos, governments have egos, you know, regulatory you know, agents have e egos, markets have no egos. Which brings me to my final linkage, firms and society. In the original utopian world, I assume that firms create no social cause and have no social benefits. In the world that we live in, let's face it, every business, no matter how small, has both social costs and social, social benefits. And this is, of course, what you wrestle with when you talk about corporate social responsibility, when you talk about you know, sustainable companies. This has become a third of your MBA program, right? For better or worse, wrestling with this. And I'm not sure that's a great trend. And here's why I am a little troubled by delving deeper and deeper into this morass. Let me say some facts and you tell me whether you agree with them. The first is, a lot of these social costs and benefits are unknowable, right? I'm not talking about the ones where we can put a number, there are lots of it. But let's face it, a lot of the social costs we see now, people didn't see when they were originally created, asbestos, when it was first created as a, was considered a, a great thing because now people could carry this light material rather than the heavy stuff. It was good for your back. No, until 20 years later and you discovered that asbestos caused cancer. We act like bad companies create social costs and good companies don't. What do we find out 10 years from now that PowerPoint makes you stupid? There's actually a thesis going around that PowerPoint makes you think in bullet points and after a while you can't, so you need the bullet point. Without a bullet point, your brain can't even go. It'd be a horrible, think of how many slides you're seeing in this class. I've created a huge social cost and I didn't even know it when I did it. We, you know, we act like, you no, know, we act like we know what the social costs and benefits are, but we know what we know now. Yeah. I hate to quote another un unquotable person, but remember Donald Rumsfeld? What did he say? You, you can't know the unknowable, something like this, very similar. I'm going to be a Donald Rumsfeld. You don't know the unknowable. 
And that means that you might think you're doing the right things and discover 10 years later that you've been doing all these horrible things for society. The second is social costs and social benefits are in the eyes of the beholder. I mean, in our house, we make joint decisions, I think, most of the time, maybe. But let's face it, my wife is an environmentalist the nth degree. If she finds even a trace of an environmental cause that, so I don't ever let her look at our portfolio. I'd be afraid of what would happen after she looks. That's off the line. That's, uh, there'd be nothing left. <laughs> because to her, even that small cost, because let's face it, social costs and social benefits depending, depend on what your priority list is. So can you imagine being in a business where there are five people around the table and you decide to bring social costs into the discussion? One person's an environmentalist, the other person cares about labor rights. By the time you get around that table, nothing. You're going to end up in complete paralysis if you let this process get out of control. I'm not saying you should go out and be a corporate outlaw, but I'm saying this is a lot more difficult than we make it out to be. Corporate sustainability. I've never even understood what's so great about corporate sustainability. Why do we need corporations to live forever? That's like those Egyptian pharaohs wanting to live forever, right? That worked out great for them. What did they do? They wrapped themselves up in ribbons and they stuck themselves under the ground. Those mummies are still dead. There are a lot of corporate mummies around that are kept alive. Because you say, I don't know, if only I can make... It doesn't make any sense to me that you want to sustain a corporation, but I'm glad I'm not an MBA student because if I showed up in class and what's so great about corporate sustainability and the class was about corporate sustainability, I'd probably fail the class. Okay? <laughs> But you've got to navigate through all this process, and that's... So I'm going to leave you with the way I think about social costs. I have no problem with companies going out and spending money to be socially responsible. In fact, a lot of the time, I think it's good for them. So I'm going to make this specific. Let's say that you're Disney. Half your annual report is about how socially responsible you are. Right? You take the annual reports, all pictures, Look, at we're helping underprivileged here. We're in Costa Rica. We're doing this. We're doing that. Okay, great. You're socially responsible. Let's see how much you're willing to spend being socially responsible. So I'm going to make this a very specific example. You've decided that you want to open a Disney store in downtown New York. You've been in downtown New York. The city's emptied out. There's almost no businesses left. But he said, this will create you know, traffic on the street. This is good for the town. So we're going to open it. And I'm going to make this a very clear choice. If you open this, you're going to lose $100,000 a year for as far as the eye can see. So you're not doing, so I'm, what I'm doing is I'm not allowing you the cop-outs, which is we'll do this and we'll run an ad and that'll increase sales in our shorter store. No, no, no. So there's no way out. You're going to open this store. It is going to lose you money. But by doing it, you create some benefits to society. So your Disney managers, would you open the store? So half that annual report, I'm going to come back to you. So what's so the social responsibility stuff? If you're not willing to spend the money, and in many companies, when push comes to shove, they can talk a good game of social responsibility, but they can't spend money on it. I'll be quite honest. As a Disney stockholder, I'm OK with them doing this, as long as they tell me what they're doing. To me, that's really at the core of corporate. So I want transparency in the process because you're, in a sense, taking my money and you're being very charitable with my money. And it's so easy to be charitable with other people's money. Have you noticed this? <laughs> and you're doing it with your favorite causes. So you like the Met. You give $10 million to the Met as Disney. I'm going to get really pissed off. I'd rather that that $10 million go elsewhere. So that's really what the big debate should be about is who should be spending the money on social responsibility. Because let's face it, if Disney didn't do this and paid a bigger dividend to you, there's nothing stopping you from being charitable. So let's not make this. Companies don't spend money on social responsibility. That money doesn't get spent. It might get spent by the shareholders on different charities. And it's, in a sense, their choice to make. And that, I think, is where I find my biggest problem with the way corporate social responsibility has evolved, is it's become a lot of show stuff, right? Half the annual report, you have to tell the world how socially responsible you are. And it becomes the manager's choices on social responsibility that I have to go along with. And most of the time, if I'm doing well, I'm going to cut 
slack to the management. Say, okay, I'm okay with that, but only if I feel that you're taking care of the rest of my interests. So when we come back on Wednesday, we'll complete this process of objectives because I've really muddied the waters at this stage, right? Because every conceivable linkage we talked about could go wrong. I read stories that I put into the context of corporate governance. I see. In, so basically, I almost have a folder in your in your computer or in your head. Yeah. Every time you read a story, that matters. You put it in, because otherwise, you just get stories that come in.